This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So welcome to 117, and I know we've had a few listeners ask about or the ability to see your first 3D printed item. So where are you at with that? Uh, so I called them, and it's shipping, I think they said this week. But the, the, the company that makes these things, they ship them in batches. So I guess my my batch is slated to ship this week. But we've picked out, the kids and I have picked out the, the items that we're going to print. So hopefully we'll have something to show off uh, by maybe next week. Or next time it's us, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, interesting. I, I, I'm doing this Peloton challenge by myself for the month of September to try to do uh, every day this month of September to do 30 minutes and burn up to 400 kilojoules, which for me is a pretty good clip. It was tough enough for me. So I just kind of threw it out on Twitter and have a few listeners actually going to join me for the rest of this month. So maybe we'll do a different challenge every month. Might be kind of fun to build up our community. Um, Upcoming guests, we have Annie Duke joining us. She's the author of Thinking in Bets and also has a new book coming out called How to Decide. So I highly recommend uh, to everyone to pick up a copy of her first book, Thinking in Bets, because our interview with her will come out just after her book, How to Decide, comes out. So take a look at that, download it. Also, you might want to check out our friend Ted Seide's interview on Capital Allocators with Annie. Fabulous interview. Also want to throw a greeting out to some of our YouTube commentators, commenters. So Arnaldo and Malta, Khalid, Windowpane 1000, Enrique, Spirit of the Law, Peter Canuel, Jean-Claude Bertrand, and a ton of others. There's been a lot of engagement on YouTube, which I get a kick out of. I think it's great. Oh, it is. It is, it is great. It makes doing this stuff, uh, makes it doing it a lot, a lot more fun than it would be if there was nobody engaging and as you'll hear in this episode it actually gives us some pretty cool ideas to uh talk about and, and investigate it was really fun having mark on mark hebner on last week he had a blast kind of engaging with people on youtube as well he had a real good time so and he's going to be having a bunch of your videos i believe on his website at index fund ifa.com yeah we wanted to post links to the, some of the videos which is cool the other thing that that you know acts of kindness that people do, I'm amazed at how kind the reviews are and thoughtful that people are putting on the podcast. Yeah, and, it's great. I want to give a, a sincere thank you to uh, Niran Mojo, Lee M underscore Sask, Zalupa two twenty eight exe, <laughs> Polly Fever, Birdie in the Sky sixty three. Anesthesia MD, Hammer 6969420, and Zalupa228. Again. I get a kick out of you reading the names of well, the people that review these stuff. These people know who they are. I just think it's worth shouting out because it, it's amazing. Like th- these aren't just, you know, great podcasts. Thank you. Like, they're putting down thoughtful, as you know, comments. It's awesome. Yep, yeah, you're right. But hearing you say Hammer 6969420 is. <laughs> hey, I just. Anyways, uh, also worth mentioning too, like we get a lot of comments now and, and I wish I had more time to invest in responding to everybody. So sometimes we just can't keep up. Yeah, I think that's been the case for a while. But one of, one of the awesome things about the discussion section on the Rational Reminder site, which as a, as a side note, we will eventually improve with some sort of form or something. It's just uh, investigating what to use is time consuming and we haven't had time to do that. Um, but the discussion section is, it's, I, I feel like I keep repeating the same thing, but it's unbelievable. The discussions that are going on in there, like highly informed, um, very friendly discussions on a, on a pretty niche topic. Like how many people really want to go and get into a detailed discussion about the, you know, theoretical and, and empirical backed investing but apparently there are a lot of people that want to talk about this and it's it's really cool to see. So even though we, we're we not answering, there are some users in there that are answering uh, people's questions, which is great. It's also really cool to hear from you know, the many advisors that listen to this podcast. Yeah. There's a lot of people on LinkedIn that are, are pinging me quite often and love to hear from people, love talking shop with, with people in the business. All right. Well, we, we have a... Oh, shoot. I was going to mention the length. Oh, it's out. I said it. We have a bit of a long episode, so we're going to get to it. Doesn't matter. We kick it off with an interesting interview 
with uh, someone from the Bank of Canada, which we talk about as we get going. Is there anything else to add? No, let's go. All right, enjoy it. Welcome to episode 117 of the Rational Minder podcast. Today, we don't have a guest in the traditional sense, but we were joined by someone from the Bank of Canada for the, a segment of our episode. Now, they're, they're doing some public outreach that they don't usually do or haven't done in the past, at least. Uh, and they talk a little bit about that in our, in our conversation with them. We thought it was pretty cool. Um, we're actually the first podcast ever that the Bank of Canada has done outreach through. So it's pretty cool. They're, they're trying to engage with the public. And again, in, in our conversation, they talk about why they think that's important. Uh, but yeah, so we thought it was pretty cool to be the, the, the first ever Bank of Canada um, official conversation through the podcast medium. Yeah, you have to hand it to them for a very conservative organization, obviously, to do an outreach like that with us. It was, it was a lot of fun and really interesting to coordinate. Yeah. And it's part of a campaign that they're doing. They've got a survey uh, called the Let's Talk Inflation Survey. And as part of this public out outreach that they're trying to do for their policy decisions, they, they want Canadians to take this survey. So we'll put a link in the, in the show notes so that people can take it. I took the survey. It took about 10 minutes. The questions are, I mean, pretty technical. I think that the average Canadian would have a pretty blank stare looking at the questions. Um, our, our listeners may be less so. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I think it's worth worth checking out the, the survey. So we were joined to talk about the survey, I guess, but also just a more general discussion about what the Bank of Canada is trying to accomplish with their public outreach. We are joined by Don Coletti. He was appointed advisor to the governor of the Bank of Canada in 2013. And Don's responsible for financial system issues, including vulnerabilities, reforms, and market dynamics, and their implications for financial stability and monetary policy. Clearly uh, well-educated on the topics of uh, central banks and how they interact with financial markets and with ultimately Canadians. I agree. Before that, he was, uh, he joined the bank in 2000 and he was at the department of finance for a couple of years before that. And, uh, a lot of economic pedigree that he has for sure. Yeah. So we'll, we'll jump into the conversation that we had with him and then we'll continue on with our, our normal, uh, episode after that. Don Coletti, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Hey, thank you very much for having me today. So the Bank of Canada's current approach to monetary policy is to adjust interest rates to target a 2% inflation, but the bank's considering some alternatives. Can you talk a little bit about the alternative approaches to monetary policy that the Bank of Canada is considering? Sure. Well, let me start by uh, saying that the approach that we ultimately take uh, for monetary policy over the next five years will have real implications for people in their everyday lives. Our ability to stabilize the purchasing power of money makes it easier for Canadians to plan personal finances and business investments. Our ability to smooth swings in economic activity helps minimize job losses and financial stress for Canadians during economic downturns. Targeting 2% inflation has served Canadians very well for over 25 years. Nonetheless, every five years, the bank and the federal government renew our agreement on the monetary policy framework. And ahead of each renewal, the bank looks at how it might improve its approach. This time around, there are some new challenges. Probably the most important is the global low interest rate environment. Now, with that backdrop in mind, I would put the alternatives to the current framework into four main buckets. The first option is to raise the inflation target. The idea is that raising the inflation target will increase the nominal interest rate, giving the bank the room to lower rates again when needed. But bank researchers find that the cost of higher inflation would be significant and it would be felt by everyone, even more so by people living on fixed or lower incomes. Also, the bank's credibility could be undermined if people thought it was a slipper or slope to an even higher inflation targets down the road. The second option would be to target the aggregate price level. Unlike tar inflation targeting, targeting the level of prices means that the central bank would promise to make up for all the inflation misses along the way. That means that if inflation was to go below 2% for a period, the bank would allow inflation to run above 2% for a while to make up for it. By moving around inflation and inflation expectations in this way, central banks could get more bang for their buck 
especially when faced by the lower bound on policy interest rates. But the benefits of this approach depend heavily on everybody believing that over time, the central bank would be able to deliver on its promise of making up for all past misses. Now, our work studying how Canadians respond to price level targeting in a laboratory suggests that this may be difficult to achieve. Now, this bucket also includes a milder makeup strategy called average inflation targeting. You can think of average inflation targeting as lying somewhere in between inflation targeting and price level targeting. Now, instead of promising to make up for all past misses of the inflation target, average inflation targeting only makes up for some of the misses, say, for example, the last two or three years. So a third option that we are considering is to add full employment to the bank's current inflation objective. This is known in our business as having a dual mandate. The Fed and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand have dual mandates. But the Bank of Canada already considers a range of labour market indicators when setting policy. And when a trade-off between stabilizing inflation and unemployment does arise, we consider both. Nonetheless, there might still be some benefits from incorporating an explicit full employment objective into the bank's mandate. The fourth and final option would be to target the nominal gross domestic product. Now, that's the economic output valued at market prices. Nominal GDP targeting has received renewed attention recently because it could help reduce the chances of running into the lower bound in interest rates. It may also help promote financial stability, but it too has its drawbacks. So the bank has been doing a comprehensive side-by-side -side assessment of these and other frameworks to see if any are better. We do this work in using different economic models, including the Terms of Trade Economic Model, or TOTEM, which is the bank's main policy analysis model. So we call this work our horse race. We assess the different policy frameworks by their capacity to do three things. To meet their stated objectives, to support the well-being of Canadians, and to serve Canadians well in both good and bad times. Very interesting. You, you mentioned average inflation targeting, which the Federal Reserve uh, in the U.S. has, has changed to. They, they've, they've made that change. What do you think about that move from them? Yes, yeah, so we, we've looked carefully at the Federal Reserve strategy review with great interest. You know, similar reviews are going on in many countries around the world, and researchers and central banks and academia from all around the world are in frequent contact, sharing their insights and the lessons learned. Governor McCallum said last week that the bank is hardened to see the Fed and other jurisdictions adopt elements of our long-standing framework review and renewal process. For example, the Fed has now moved to a five-year review of their framework, something we, that we've been doing for a long time. The Fed also said that it will likely aim to achieve inf inflation moderately above 2% for some time after periods of low inflation. So that is a very specific type of average inflation targeting. As I indicated earlier, we are looking at average inflation targeting and other options within the context of our own review for Canada. What I can tell you so far is that our work suggests that average inflation targeting has some benefits over the alternatives, including inflation targeting, in certain, certain circumstances. But so far, there is no regime that absolutely dominates in all circumstances. Wow. Now, now the, the, the current approach, like we mentioned at the beginning, has is, is been around for 25 years. H how open do you think the Bank of Canada is to actually making a change? Yes, yeah, there's no question that our current monetary policy framework has proven thus far to be the best option for keeping low, stable, and predictable inflation. It's also done very well in terms of stabilizing output and employment in the face of large adverse shocks to the economy. But no system is perfect, and that's why the bank is always looking at how it might improve its approach. Now, these efforts crystallize every five years as part of the renewal of the agreement on Canada's monetary policy framework. Now, it's important to keep in mind that frameworks don't get set in a vacuum. And this time around, there are some new challenges. Probably the most important of these new challenges is the global interest rate environment. When global interest rates are low, there's less room for the bank to cut interest rates to support economic activity and inflation. Persistency, persistently low interest rates may also encourage households and investors to take on excessive risk. This can leave the economy exposed to boom-bust financial cycles. 
The low interest rate environment is one of the reasons why we thought it would be a good time to do a comprehensive horse race amongst the contenders. We will want to make sure that we're always doing the best possible for Canadians. Don, can you talk about why the bank is placing more emphasis now on engaging with the public as part of a renewal? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Well, traditionally, the bank has largely engaged with academic, industry, and government stakeholders while providing regular updates to the broader public via media and speeches. But in order to gather a wider diversity of views, enhance transparency, and encourage dialogue, we have expanded our consultations during this renewal cycle to include more direct engagement with the public. Now, this process has been going on for a couple of years now, well ahead of our renewal in 2021. And this engagement is really important to us, and it's important to us for three reasons. First, it improves our capacity to make better policy decisions. Second, it also enhances our legitimacy as a public institution. Now, the bank's actions affect the lives of Canadians in an important way, and Canadians have the right to understand why we do the things we do. We also believe that the more Canadians are aware of and understand the work that we do at the Bank of Canada, the more effective our policies will be. In fact, last month, Governor Macklem spoke about the imperative for central banks to engage the public directly when he addressed the world central bankers at the annual symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Now, there are other elements to this broader initiative to engage the public than just the engagement we're doing around the inflation target renewal. Let me tell you about one of them that's near and dear to me personally, and it's called The Economy Plain and Simple. So it's a publication that we introduced in September of 2018, and the idea behind it is right there in its title. So we get our economists and researchers and communications professionals to write short, quick reads with engaging visuals about the economic subjects that matter to Canadians in the simplest way possible. The subjects that we use to write about are often subjects that are and topics that are submitted to us by our readers. They ask us to write topics in, in different areas, and when possible, we're happy to, to oblige. Now, this website and this, sorry, this document has proven to be very popular, and I would encourage your listeners to give it a shot. You can find it easier, very easily on the bank's website. Yeah, I've, I've checked out that content, and it is, it is it does a really good job taking what are pretty complex topics and presenting them in really easily digestible uh, bites, kind of like you, like you were saying. Um, now, now this survey, it, it, appreciate that. Yeah, no, it, it is really great. Uh, th this survey that, that you're, you've released as part of this consultation with the, with the public, I, I've taken the survey too, and it was, it was really interesting to go through and, and uh, our, our listeners definitely should check it out. We'll put, we'll put a link in the, uh, in the notes for the show. Um, the, the survey is asking Canadians on their thoughts on some of the actions. One of the things that the survey is asking about is your thoughts on some of the actions that the bank's taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including uh, large scale asset purchases, which we've talked about on this podcast, uh, and forward guidance. Why were those questions important to include on this survey? Yeah. So as, as I said earlier, the, the process for an enhanced public engagement started off uh, long before 2020. And it always included a review of our policy toolkit and the interactions between monetary, fiscal, and macroprudential policies. Now, that extended policy toolkit includes large-scale asset purchases and for guidance, amongst other, other tools. Of course, through the experience of COVID-19, we've implemented some of these policies in real time making it easier for people to put them into context and to provide feedback. As you know, we've committed to hold interest rates at their effective lower bound until economic slack is absorbed so that the 2% inflation target is sustainably achieved. And we've also engaged in QE or large-scale asset purchases for the first time. We are now purchasing at least $5 billion per week of Government of Canada bonds to help keep interest rates low across the yield curve. Now, monetary policy works better when people understand it. Without, under, without public understanding and support for an independent central bank, we lose the risk, we lose the, we lose the public trust, and that's core to our mission. Asking for people's inputs to, to our actions gives us that direct line of sight into, into their understanding. Moreover, our governor has said many times in recent months that central banks need to spend more effort speaking to and listening to the citizens we served. The public has a right to understand what we're doing and we need to be held accountable for our actions. 
Uh, Don, can you talk about the response rate that you've had so far for the Let's Talk Inflation Survey? And also, I'm sure you've got some anecdotes yeah, so, to probably share. Sure, that sure, love to. So we're we're very pleased with the response uh, rate so far. So thousands of people across Canada are completing the survey, and we see particularly high interest from Quebec. We've had a pretty good mix of responses from all demographic groups, but we really love to see more women, more young people, and more low-income Canadians participate. One thing that we've learned so far is that perceived inflation in Canada is generally above the actual CPI inflation rate, although it's still pretty close to 2% target. The other thing I'd like to share with you is that when we asked uh, respondents if higher, more volatile prices were acceptable, in exchange for a stronger economy or higher wages, most were not in favor. In fact, most respondents feel that the bank's current inflation targeting framework or a dual mandate, which includes targeting employment as well, would best serve Canadians. So to everyone, to all the Canadians out there, I really hope you'll take 10 minutes to go on the Bank Canada website, click on Let's Talk Inflation and fill out the survey. It'll be available until October 1st. We want to hear from you. We want to know more about how price changes and the ups and downs of the economy affect you. We also want to know about how you're making your key economic and financial decisions. Now, our plan is to consolidate all the feedback and input in the heard report, which we will publish on our website in early 2021. We will then use what we learn from you to help us prepare our recommendation for a monetary policy framework to the Minister of Finance. That's great. Well, Don, we, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast to talk about this. And uh, we appreciate the bank as well um, be, being willing to use a medium like a, like the, a podcast, which I, I don't think the Bank of Canada tends to engage in. Um, so yeah, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me and uh, happy to have a chance to get the word out there to Canadians and to encourage people to participate in the survey and have a say in how uh, we're setting up a monetary policy over the next uh, five years. Thank you. Thanks, Don, very much. So we hope that you enjoyed that as, as much as we did. It, it was clearly a button-down interview, which you might expect from a, a, an organization like the Bank of, of Canada or any central bank for that matter, but definitely some really interesting information in there. Yeah, I guess we shouldn't expect any breaking market moving news on an interview like that. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, it, it was, I know I'm re repeating myself. It was, it was pretty cool to have someone like that from an organization like that on, a, on our podcast. Agree. So we'll carry on with the regularly scheduled programming. Let's go. All right. So quickly, the book of the week this week is a book recommended by our mutual friend Aiden. And the book is called Who is Michael Ovitz? So I'm not really a big Hollywood guy. I knew a little bit about him, but Michael Ovitz, um, it's basically the story of a, of a guy who was a kid loving the movie industry. It seems like as soon as he started working at a very young age, he was driven to get into the movie business and ended up becoming an extremely powerful agent in Hollywood and founder of the venerable agency, Creative Artist Agency, CAA. And it, it's a great story. It, he, he really did create a revolution in Hollywood. And what I found interesting is that he didn't just represent talent, but he also had this ability to have a vision for an idea or a story and pull it together with both the actors, the writers of the script and the studios to pull it off. And it's really fascinating how so many of these big, um, be it movies or TV series, weren't all like, I, I had a vision that was more a manufactured thing, like they knew the story that had to be told and how to do it, but it's really not. It's really highly creative how the whole thing comes together right down to, you know, there's seven major studios, and this is kind of before all the the, the Netflix and Amazon Prime, et cetera, that are creating content. So it's a different era, but it's really interesting how different studios have different you know, economic models for how the movies are made, how they choose different actors and how the deals actually come together. So we got into great detail about pulling a number of deals off. I mean, things like um, completely unexpected things like how successful Shogun was. Uh, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park is one of their ideas. Rain Man, they thought Rain Man was gonna be a complete flop. Um, he's also um, deeply involved in a lot of the big 
um, production companies that were taken over by other companies. So he was very involved in, in, the, in when Sony took over Columbia Pictures. And then later in the book, he gets into how he got involved in Silicon Valley with a number of the big names that and one of them we've talked about a few weeks ago with Peter Thiel, but many others. So he got into the investment game as well on the other end. So bottom line, it's a fun read. If you're into Hollywood at all, you'll really enjoy it. It's a story of risk taking and family dynamics. I enjoyed it very much. Cool. That, that dovetails with the, the book that I mentioned uh, recently, the master switch about information empires. Yeah. They talk about how in, in that book, the story of Hollywood and how it, it used to be the opposite of how you described it, closed and non-creative and regimented. And it wasn't until uh, those empires, I guess, those information empires that were controlling the movie industry uh, started to be dismantled, which I think came from regulation, if I remember correctly from the book. That was a good book. I think last time I mentioned it, I was just starting to read it. I finished reading it now. Definitely, definitely worthwhile. So I've downloaded it. It's in the queue. I just need more time in the day, apparently. I'll be curious to hear your summary. Your book summary is always good. Speaking of content, I know you said a, a while ago you liked Animal Kingdom, where you kind of got hooked on watching Animal Kingdom. So we were introduced to another one, similar vein, called Kingdom. It's just as crazy, outrageous, horrifying as Animal Kingdom but it's got to do in, in the industry of MMA, mixed martial arts. It's, it, yeah, it is as crazy as Animal Kingdom. So we're, we're about, I don't know, six or seven episodes into that. Anyways, in other news, I just loved, thought this story that, that our friend Barry Riddles posted on the weekend was really interesting. Did you know that Starbucks has $1.6 billion, billion in stored value card liabilities? These are like gift cards or money on your, your Starbucks app. Unbelievable amount of basically interest-free debt. And every year, Starbucks recognizes a portion of those liabilities that they assume will be completely lost, and that's known as breakage. So get this, Starbucks recognized the amount as profit. And in 2018, Starbucks recognized $155 million in breakage which is about 10% of all the stored value balances. That blow your mind. People just flushing money down the toilet. That's crazy. And I, I know around our house, like my kids have a number of these gift cards sitting in their bedrooms just waiting to be spent, but they've been sitting there for who knows how long. I wonder if I have any gift cards. I don't think I do. I don't think I do. I doubt you would. Um, not, next item. Um, so two weeks ago, we went through uh, with um, we we went through you and I the list of nudges that da that uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby wrote about, and one of the nudges was keeping the benefits of keeping an inheritance in a separate account. And, and the argument at the time that I was making was keeping it separate doesn't necessarily make sense. It may not necessarily be rational, but it can perhaps make you a better investor. So a, a, a listener kindly posted that actually keeping it separate. An inheritance situation does make sense because it is a way to ensure that it does not get included in any division of assets should you go through a relationship breakup. So I completely agree. And I wasn't specifically talking about the inheritance necessarily. It was more about the, the notion of keeping money in separate buckets. So the listener is absolutely correct. And, and I'm grateful to get that impact, that, that input and feedback. Yeah, for sure. So from a family law perspective, it, it can make a lot of sense to keep assets separate because like you said, they they then get, and, and inheritances get excluded from division of assets, but if they have been kept separate, um, it's just a lot clearer. I think if they're commingled or used toward purchasing a matrimonial home, um, then they may not be included in the division. So do you want to quickly go over the news on planning designations? Sure. I just want to say real quick though, that that, that comment is one of many, uh, the, the discussion that goes on in the rational minor discussion page and on the episode comment sections, but more so in the general discussion, some of it is like, it's really, really good. Yes. We talk, we'll talk in, in the, our, our planning topic about a little bit about some of it was inspired by one of those posts, but somebody wrote a program in Java to test historical safe withdrawal <laughs> rates 
for factor loaded portfolios. And it's like, what? And they posted their, their code on, on uh, GitHub so people could see it. Anyway, bit of a digression there. Yes, let's talk about the uh, title regulation. So this is a new development. So the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, who is responsible for supervising and regulating a broad range of financial service sectors, including auto, home, life, health insurance, pensions, credit unions, mortgage brokers, etc., so they have set proposed standards for planners and advisors. And I know we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. We thought it would be worth digging into a bit more. So the Globe and Mail had an article earlier this year um, that highlighted that Ontario had passed the Financial Professionals Title Protection Act, which requires anyone who wants to use the title of financial advisor or financial planner to obtain appropriate credentials from recognized professional bodies and remain in good standing. So to that end, there is a proposal from the FSRA that reps who want to call themselves financial planners will need to have higher credentials than those who want to be called a financial advisor. So the credentialing bodies will be required to demonstrate to the FSRA how their designation aligns with the education requirements in the proposed rule. It's also in interesting to note that there will be no grandfathering for existing planners and advisors, and some existing designations may not meet the new standards. And they mentioned the life license qualification program may not, meaning if this is the case, those that hold only that designation will not be able to call themselves planners or advisors. Which it makes sense. I've done the LLQP program. I wouldn't call it a designation. It's a life insurance license um, qualifying program. You need it to sell insurance. Uh, it's not overly challenging. I mean, it. you need to know about insurance to write the exam. You do not need to know about financial planning to write and pass the exam. So, I mean, that just that's just sensible. I, th I think one of the most telling outcomes of this whole process is going to be when they go through that review to, to determine if designations align with that, with education requirements proposed in the rule, what, what are they going to approve? Because a, a, an example is Advocus, uh, which is an association of, um, I guess, a financial advisor association. They've just come up with their own credential. I can't remember what it's called, um, but presumably it's not going to be as rigorous. I, I'm, I'm making an assumption here. Maybe it will be but I'm going to assume that it's not going to be as rigorous as the CFP program, which is fairly rigorous. So where, where's the bar? I think that's going to be the most telling thing. I agree. Because one, one, one of the outcomes of this could be that uh, a new credentialing bodies come out with credentials that bear, meet the bare minimum of the, of the regulations. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of different titles out there that aren't going to mean very much. But so many people now are not credentialed. Anyways, that's true. Something's better than nothing. That's that's a fair a fair point. And there's no currently there's no Canada wide legislation on standards other than inside Quebec, which has its own set of rules. Yeah, I mean that's a an issue with Canadian securities regulation more broadly speaking. Financial yeah. planning, I guess you could argue, is different from different from securities regulation. Like I mean, it, it is different. So yeah, I think more more financial planning regulation in Canada is a good is a good thing. We agree. So you, you wanted to talk about SoftBank? Uh, yeah, somebody, I, there's been in the news a bunch a few weeks ago. Um, I had somebody email about it. Thought we'd mention it quickly. It, it came out as this big story that SoftBank was, was piling into call options on tech stocks, making these huge bets, and that they were responsible for the rally in tech and all this stuff. I'm glad we didn't talk about it when all of that was happening because more information came out later um, I don't know how definitive any of this is because I don't think, at, at least not from what I could find, the SoftBank has come out and explained exactly what they were doing. But we, we do know that they have a, a public securities arm that they've that they created. Um, but you, you can never know exactly what's going on by looking at uh, trans transaction records or anything like that because not everything's public. A lot of it can be done over the counter. Um, so the, the information that's come out since that initial news broke from the Financial Times is that they were, they were actually deploying call spreads, which means that they were both buying and selling calls, which is actually a pretty conservative thing to do. It's a way to participate in some of the upside 
while limiting uh, limiting downside. Interesting. Which is not nearly as crazy as, you know, people were saying that they had this massive leveraged exposure of no. $50 billion with their $4 billion of call options, which might be true if they were only buying calls, but if they were buying and selling calls, entering into, into call spreads, it actually wasn't that crazy of a thing. Interesting. And, that was the story though, the $50 billion. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's what I'm saying. We did, I'm glad we didn't cover it because there were news articles, our articles that came out like the week after. Yep. Saying, ah, this is actually probably more like more likely what's what's going on. Uh, and then the other piece of that is that if if they were doing the call spreads as opposed to the the calls, they wouldn't have been moving the price as much. They wouldn't have been responsible for the tech rally if that's what they were doing. Um, the, the the thing that I read that was explaining this though was also saying that the one of the more likely causes of the rally, and you can never pinpoint exactly what the cause of a rally is. Um, but one, one of the things might have been the short-term option activity from retail traders. Apparently, retail option activity has been massive through platforms like Robinhood is one that people talk about the most. Um, but short-term options require the market makers to hedge against the option exposure. So they purchase the underlying securities, which can increase stock prices. And the thing I was reading was saying uh, there was about the $4, the $4 billion of option activity from SoftBank, but there was about $40 billion over the same time period from retail mm. traders, like people okay. sitting at home on their, on their Robinhood accounts. Yeah. Wow. Always more to it than there appears to be at, at when a story like that breaks. It, it did seem, when I read that at first, like, geez, SoftBank's crazy. <laughs> but it seems like they're still crazy, but maybe not as crazy as it appeared. So on to the big meat of the episode today, where we've you've merged kind of the investment and planning topic into one combined topic this week. Yeah. So this is the this is the part that was inspired by uh one of the people commenting in the rational reminder discussions named Samuel. Uh you can see his comments in there. Uh, and the link to his code, if you want to take a look at it. Um, I'm not exactly fluent in Java, so I, I didn't necessarily review his code, but the, the <laughs> idea behind what he, the analysis that he was doing is, is what inspired, inspired this. We, we, I've recreated something similar to his model using Visual Basic in, uh, in Excel so that we could run our own, our own analysis. Uh, so what's the big picture? Where are you going with this? Yeah, so it's all about withdrawal rates. Uh, Samuel was, that was asking, you know, I, I've heard Ben rubbish the 4% rule on, on YouTube and on the podcast, but what about with factors? And it's true. Any time that we've talked about the 4% rule not making sense has always been considering the market portfolio. So, I mean, it was, it was right of Samuel to be questioning uh, whether or not there's more to it if we start to include factors, which is exactly what he was trying to do in uh in his model so i wanted to address it in in as much detail as i as i could particularly because the people who are listening to this podcast are well aware of factor investing the idea that there's more than just the market risk premium that, that drives stock returns and they may even have factor tilted portfolios so the idea of safe withdrawal rates with a factor tilted portfolio is particularly relevant to our uh our audience mm -hmm. So we modeled it. And w w one of the things that Samuel found, so I, I wasn't able to recreate this part of his code and I don't really fully understand how it worked in his model, but he was able to back test the optimal mix of factor loadings for safe withdrawal rates. So I used his findings as a, as a guide to input into the model that I built. My model, my model didn't optimize um, for it the way that his did. Oh, so he that's found interesting. He had an optimizer to get to this sweet spot for factor. Loading. Yes. He could find the maximum safe withdrawal rate by changing the factor loadings for the portfolio using Fama French data going back to 1926 or whenever the Ken, Ken French data set starts. Interesting. And, I, and it was interesting. It was really interesting. It, it ended up being something around 0.5 loading on market beta, 0.5 on size and a one loading on uh, value. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the practical implications of building a portfolio like that in a, in a minute. But first I wanna talk through uh, 
it, it, safe withdrawal rates for different indexes, just different stock indexes. So not, a, not an optimal back-tested portfolio. So I used 50-year safe withdrawal rates. So 50-year time period and found the, uh, max, the, the, the amount that you could have withdrawn in the worst period to not run out of money. Same as the... Yeah, what do you mean? Rule. What do you mean by what, that? The worst period. So what, what percentage of the portfolio in the first year? So 50 years ago. Yeah. What percentage of the portfolio could you have withdrawn 50 years ago and then adjusted that dollar amount for inflation monthly yep. Yep. thereafter? I, I use monthly inflation um, such that you wouldn't have run out of money in the worst period, the worst 50 year period. Also, it's not just the last 50 years, not just looking at 1970 to now. No, from all, all the rolling monthly 50 year periods. Gotcha. Okay. What was the amount that you could have spent so that you, and actually had a, I had a 1% failure thre threshold. So this is the amount that you could have spent in the first year, such that only 1% of the 50 year periods resulted in failure, resulted in running out of money. So all the 50 year periods going back to the late twenties and then moving it ahead all, all the 50 year periods, January to January. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so then the safe withdrawal rate is that amount that you could have spent in the, in the first month. Well, I guess the safe withdrawal rate is the amount you could have spent in the first year, but I was doing the modeling monthly. Uh, okay. And then that just to, sorry, just to be clear so that everyone gets it. So it's the dollar amount on that first month. And then that dollar amount increased with inflation. You're not doing the safe withdrawal rate each month. It's the dollar amount of the first month. And that carries on with inflation through the subsequent 50 years. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. So the first monthly withdrawal is based on the safe withdrawal rate and then adjusted for inflation thereafter. Cool. Now the, the, the research on this usually looks at us market, just us equities. So I, I did look at that. So for the Fama French us total market index, which is like VTI, like the, the Vanguard total market, total U S market index. And the safe withdrawal rate there was 3.1%. S and P 500 was 3.35, which is interesting, but higher. Uh, Fama French U S growth index. So market wide growth, 2.85% safe withdrawal rate. And yeah, I won't go through all of them because yeah, a lot of them are pretty are around 3%, but I'll go through the ones that are not 3%. Uh, U S small cap, so just small cap universe, 3.4% safe withdrawal rate. Interesting. Small cap growth, 1.9% safe withdrawal rate. Also interesting. And we know that the risk adjusted returns of small cap growth tend to be pretty awful. So that's no surprise. Small cap value. Now this one's interesting because we, we talk about the sequence of return risk and how volatility is bad in the withdrawal phase. And that's true. But even though that's true, the U.S. Small Value Research Index had a 3.6% safe withdrawal rate, the highest of all of the indexes that I looked at. And that in terms of factor characteristics, factor exposures, is pretty close to something like IJS or AVUV, the, the Avanta Small Value. So that's 100% of the portfolio in the U.S. Small Value. Correct. Wow. Which would be horrifying, horrifying to live through, I'm sure. Well, there must have been some rough periods in that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have that data up in this screen that I'm looking at here, but I, I did run the maximum drawdown for all of these portfolios and small value did not have the worst maximum drawdown. I think it was actually large value that had the worst. Hmm. And the worst drawdowns all happened in Great Depression era and they were all around uh, 88%, but small value did not have the worst of the index that I tested, which is interesting. But I, I, the returns would have been the most volatile though but it got you the highest safe withdrawal rate if you could stick with a strategy, which most people probably wouldn't have. And if you could access a small value portfolio, which again, you wouldn't have been able to throughout these time periods. Strategy is only as good as your ability to stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll touch more on that too, as we go through this topic. Uh, the Fama French US value research index, so market wide value, 3.3% safe withdrawal rate. And this is for 50 year periods. I just want to point that out because the, the original 4% rule analysis that people might be familiar with was based on a 30 year withdrawal period. So if we went back and looked at S and P 500 for 30 years, it would have a 4% safe withdrawal rate for 50 years. It's 3.35, which is the analysis we're talking about now. Uh, micro caps were 3%, which is, uh, I was actually kind of surprised by, I thought they'd do a little better. Um, 
And then I looked at the dimensional US vector equity index, which is a, an index that represents the factor exposure that the vector equity funds have. Uh, and it was 3.35. Vector is kind of like a not quite small cap value concentrated portfolio. It's more of a market portfolio heavily tilted towards small cap and value. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the best one was small value, like I, like I mentioned, which on its own was a pretty interesting finding. Uh, for, for 30 year periods, I also wanted to mention that William Bengen, the guy who created the 4% rule, uh, he's since updated his model to be 4.5% based on the inclusion of small cap value stocks. I didn't go and look at exactly what allocation of small cap value stocks he was talking about or if it was all small cap value with bonds. I didn't dig into that, but I, I do know that he's updated the number to 4.5% for a 30 year period using US stock data, which as we've talked about on the podcast in the past, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do. And that's a recent update? Uh, somewhat recent. It was actually on Reddit. He did a Reddit AMA, which is kind of interesting. Um, and in there, he said that he's changes. Yeah, spending rule. Uh, okay. So the, 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 I, I mentioned that the characteristics of the U.S. Small Value Research Index are pretty close to something like IJS or ABUV. IJS is the iShares small cap value. I think it's the S&P uh, 600 small cap value index. That's right. Uh, and the factor, of the three factor coefficients, and we're, I'm only talking about three factor because five factor data doesn't start until 1963 for profitability and investment. So three factors, what goes back really, really far. Um, so this, this portfolio has an SMB coefficient. So it's the exposure to changes in the small minus big premium of 0 0.93, which is pretty big. Mm -hmm. And it has an HML coefficient. So that's exposure to the high minus low, um, high the value, uh, value minus growth coefficient of 0 0.78. So that means that if, if um, value stocks minus growth stocks, whatever that premium is, positive or negative, this index would capture 0 0.78, 78% of that variation. In, uh, in, in returns. And likewise, if we just use market beta as a simple example, if you're investing in a traditional market cap weighted index fund, it's going to have a market, it should have a market beta of one. So it's, it's factor exposure to the changes in the market risk premium, which is the market over, over um, one month treasury bills. If you've got a market beta of one, you're going to capture 100% of that variation. So that's what all these, all these factor regression coefficients are how much of the variation in the premium, would you expect to capture, or would this allocation historically have have captured? Now it's interesting to see that the the SMB loading, the small minus big coefficient, on the U.S. Small Value Research Index is 0.93, because to get a coefficient of one, you should technically be long all of the small stocks and short all of the big stocks. This portfolio isn't short anything; it's a long only index portfolio. So why does it have such a high regression coefficient? It's because it's concentrated in the smallest, um, cheapest stocks. I'm, I'm guessing cheap stocks tend to be smaller, so you get a really high loading. It's that we, in a past episode, we talked about um, how you can get uh, higher factor loadings by being more concentrated in a position. So if you go and take the smallest stocks, not the smallest half, but the smallest like 10%, say, your SMB loading is going to be high. So I think that's why this has such a high loading without being actually short anything. Now, concentration has other trade-offs, but we're going to leave that, leave that alone <laughs> for now. So like I mentioned before, in, in Samuel's model using Java, he found something around uh, a 0.5 market beta, 0.5 size, and one, so full long short exposure to the value premium, gave the highest withdrawal rate in this data sample. And it gave a, a safe withdrawal rate of 5.5%, which is pretty staggering when you consider 3.6 was the highest with just the, uh, the small cap value portfolio. So a huge increase in safe withdrawal rate. But this portfolio is short the market, or I guess you could just be, no, yeah, it's got to be short the market. Not, not full exposure to the size, not full long short exposure to the size premium, but full long short ex exposure to the value premium. So that could come from high concentration in the cheapest stocks. 
I don't know how you get to exactly, you'd have to short the market a bit to get there, which I think from a practical perspective is probably not realistic for most people. And this, it was pretty sensitive to those loadings. Like I tried doing higher weights on market beta and higher weights on size, like something that you could probably more realistically get with a long only portfolio. And the, the safe withdrawal rate fell off a cliff pretty, pretty quickly. So I think this is sort of theoretically interesting, practically, maybe not super useful, uh, but there are practical implications, I think, that are important to, to talk through. This is so fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, you think about why, why does that portfolio that's long the value premium, which means long value and short growth, uh, and short the market and, and only 0.5 exposure to size, why does that do well? Or why did it do well over this sample period? And so then you start getting into the, how, how do the factors interact with each other? Like when the market is doing something, how does value tend to be doing and how does size tend to be doing. So I'm wondering, is it something to do with the smoothness of returns? But you have smoothness and growth or I mean, growth of dollars going on as well. Yeah, there's bo both of those things are happening. There, there are some interesting papers that try to quantify sequence risk and look at the, the try to make some make up some measures about how you how you look at that. Uh, and, and volatility is a big piece of obviously sequence risk. Although not doesn't necessarily dictate it. Uh, but there was a paper that I found in the Journal of Portfolio Management, and the paper is called A Wealth Management Perspective on Factor Premia and the Value of Downside Protection by Lewis Scott and Stefano Caviglia. And so they were basically looking at the interaction between factors. Um, they, they, they tested an investment in the, in the global equity portfolio, so like a market cap weighted index fund, uh, and then compared that to an investment in the the uh, uh, the market so a normal index fund with an overlay in either so an, an an excess exposure to either size the the size premium the value premium the quality premium or the momentum premium so market with excess exposure to one of those and then they all also tested market with excess exposure to all of those in equal weights and they said they did equal weights to avoid the kind of data mining that Samuel ran into by finding that that ex post optimal factor exposure. So the, the, the purpose in this paper was basically to, to, to see how, how would we expect those or how have those uh, interactions historically looked and what can we learn from that. Uh, and instead of just using historical data, they used um, what, what they called block bootstraps, circular block bootstraps, which I had not heard about before, but they select a month at random and then sample a 12 month period starting with that randomly selected month. Uh, and, and there's a good reason for using this approach as opposed to a normal bootstrap. It's because it preserves the auto regressive structure present in the market and factors. So trying to preserve the relationship between the factors. If you did a bootstrap where you're randomly selecting every single month, then any, any relationship between them would disappear. So they use this model to run a bunch of simulations with data from 1990 to 2012, which is a bit of a short data sample, but We'll talk about some other research that has longer, uh, longer time series to analyze. So I mentioned the interaction between the factors being important. They, they observed that, the, that size is a pro-cyclical factor, so it tends to move with the market. And I thought, I thought this was an interesting finding because it relates directly to uh, a paper that Cliff Asnes wrote, but also comments that Cliff made when he was on our podcast in episode 93 about small caps just being higher beta stocks. So this finding supports that, which, I mean, no, no surprise. Um, so si small caps tend to be, they tend to move with the market, but with a higher, a higher beta. Um, in, in this data set, they did say that that relationship was weak. It was present, but it was weak. And then quality and momentum, they said are counter-cyclical. Value appears to be weakly counter-cyclical, but the variation uh, did not appear to be significant. So those are all interesting and important points. And one of the other papers that we'll talk about in a second, they found value uh, to be uh, more, more, more countercyclical, cyclical, not just weekly. So all of that, though, speaks to the diversification benefit of adding factors. And that's really what this paper that we're talking about right now, it's what it's all about. Can you increase the, the from a wealth management perspective, can you build a better portfolio using 
using factors. So we'll talk a little bit about their, their results. They simulated 20 year periods and they found that the distribution of outcomes, which is really what we care about, uh, was improved pretty much across the board by adding any of the factors. And it was definitely improved by adding all of the factors. Uh, they found that the, the median value of a $1 investment in the equity portfolio, in the market portfolio, uh, rises from $4.15 over 20 years. So that's the median value of a in regular market cap weighted index fund investment. Um, it gives you $14. It goes up to $4.86 when you add small caps. $9.97 when you add value. $16.13 when you add momentum. Eight ninety six for quality, and nine nine dollars and ten cents for the equal weighted multi factor portfolio. Wow! So median the median result improves, which is important. But we also care about the shape of the distribution and how the factor exposure affects that. So the fifth percentile, the worst five percent of the outcomes, was improved in all cases, except for the case of adding just small caps, which again makes sense with the pro cyclical nature of uh, small caps that we were talking about before. Uh, but if you look at the the fifth percentile, so just the market in the in the fifth percentile of outcomes from their simulations, you had one dollar and six cents left. So over twenty years, you're basically break even. Adding small caps brought that up to one dollar and nine cents, marginally better, but not not really, and probably not for the amount of additional volatility that you're taking on. But for all of the other factors, so market plus value, the fifth percentile was two dollars and twenty seven cents. Market plus momentum two sixty five. Market plus quality three sixty two, and then the the market plus all factors combined left you with two dollars and sixty eight cents in the fifth percentile of outcomes. So I thought that was a pretty important finding. It's giving you that by uh, re- reducing the left tail of the distribution of outcomes, which is obviously attractive when we're talking about building building portfolios. Uh, they they also asked, and this one was was really useful from a practical perspective. They asked, what, what, if, what if the factor premiums in the future are lower than they've been in the past? Which is something that we've been living through, whether this continues at, at this magnitude or not. Who knows? Hopefully it doesn't. Um, but just theoretically, once the factors have been discovered and documented and published and everybody's piling into them, or maybe they are, uh, you, may, you would maybe expect smaller premiums. So they cut the historical factor premiums by 50%. And they obviously found that the the median wealth over 20 years was reduced, which obviously you'd expect because we're cutting the premium by 50%. Yep. Um, But the fifth percentile of outcomes were still better, a lot better with the factor tilts. So even, even if the magnitude of the premiums isn't huge, the diversification benefit of adding, adding them to the portfolio was still very meaningful, except for small caps, again. So then they looked at drawdown statistics. So what was the worst peak to trough drawdown over the 20 year simulated periods? And no surprise, again, they find that the factor loaded portfolios in both the 50% haircut case and the the normal uh, premium case, the drawdowns were significantly improved uh, across, across the board, which was again, one of the, one of the potential benefits of adding the factor exposure. I I didn't really see that too much when I ran the, when I ran my simulations that I was talking about a second ago on the safe withdrawal rates. I mean, the, the, the quality was the biggest reduction adding quality, which is like adding profitability. And I didn't have that in my simulation because I, like I mentioned before, the Fama French uh, data going back to 1927 doesn't have quality. Um, the, the multi-factor though, in, in, in this simulation, the multi-factor portfolio had a very favorable drawdown. I mean, market in this case was 93% was the worst drawdown. And market plus the multi-factor additions was a 79% drawdown. It was still pain for sure. Yes. But not nearly as, as bad. 
And I, I pulled a couple of quotes from their concluding remarks in their paper that I thought were important. So they, they said, our, our result, which favors a portfolio of factor premia overlay remains unchanged. As previously, as previously suggested, the benefit of factor premia is not in their mean returns, but rather in their ability to mitigate adverse conditions as, for instance, captured by drawdown statistics during the 20-year wealth accumulation journey. And they also said, we, we believe that the main contribution to the, of this article is to provide fairly robust orders of magnitude statistics that highlight the diversification value of factor premia in a multi-period portfolio construction problem. This diversification value is over and above the conventional expected return benefits that have been expounded in the smart beta literature. Important findings. In very simple terms, there's a diversification benefit to factors over and above and separate from the higher expected return benefit that we, we often get stuck talking about. Yeah, it's about protection more so than returns. Right, which is you know counterintuitive when we talk about the premiums being risk premiums. You're taking more risk by adding factors. But I think one of the things that we mentioned sometimes, maybe not enough, but what this research is highlighting is that the, the factors perform, they're all risks, they're all independent risks, but in absolute terms, by adding factors together, you're not necessarily taking more risk. This literature is suggesting that you're taking less risk because you're adding independent risks together. Because you're isolating them, then blending them back together in this recipe. Yeah, exactly. And they're going to perform, behave differently. Uh, okay, so then I want to talk about another paper that looked at a longer data series, but it looked at the Fama French five factors through business cycles. Um, so this, this one, we may have mentioned the podcast before. I've definitely mentioned it in a, in a YouTube video in, in the past, but it's a 2017 paper titled Fama French Factors and Business Cycles. Pretty creative title. <laughs> um, by, by Arnav Sheth and T. Lim. And they looked at the market size, the market size, value, momentum, investment, and profitability factors across business cycles. And they broke the business cycle into four stages, recession, early stage recovery, late stage recovery, and very late stage recovery. And they examined how each of the factors performed through those different uh, segments of the economic cycle. And they also threw in, although I don't think I talk about it in this um, segment here, but they, they also looked at how uh, the factors perform following yield curve inversions. Um, they, they looked at 10 US recessions, which is the data we're going to talk about, designated by the National Bureau of Economic Research going back to 1953. And they examined the cumulative factor returns for the 10 months following the start of each recession. And 10 months is relevant because that's the median length of historical US recessions. Of course. Uh, so they found the best performing factors in a recession on average were the investment factor, which had a, an average cumulative 10 month premium of 18.3%. Pretty good uh, during recessions. And then the value factor, which is the one that I think we're probably most interested in for this conversation. Uh, the value factor was second with an average cumulative 10 month premium of 12.5% during recessions. So there's that counter cyclical nature of, uh, of value showing up. In, in the early and late stages of the economic cycle, the investment premium was not so good. So it was the best, um, best during the recession, but in the recovery, not so good. But the value premium was pretty good all the way uh, right in, into the late stage, but then it tapers off in the late stage. So again, we see this, this diversification benefit, this uh, low correlation um, between the various factors, which becomes increasingly important as we're talking about stuff like safe withdrawal rates. And there's another paper that I'm, I'm not going to dig into the details, but it's, it's uh, just worth mentioning their finding. So there's a paper from 2012 by Jared Kaiser and Antiel Manon titled, The Death of Diversification Has Been Greatly Exaggerated. And they found, this is a quote from the concluding remarks of their paper, uh, factor diversification has been more effective than asset class diversification in general and in particular during crises. Right. Okay. So that's the interaction between factors, not just how does adding a factor, but how, to, how does adding factors affect withdrawal rates? And I guess we could have looked at something like a, 
building a portfolio of market small value and value or something like that and Tesla withdrawal rates on that. I didn't do that. Maybe that's a further, further research problem. The other thing that I wanted to mention, because this came up, I think, in that same comment thread on the rational minor discussion, was the idea of value spreads. And again, it ties back to the, the, one of the ways that we've tried to discredit the 4% rule. And I don't mean discredit like we're trying to be mean to them. It's just I, I don't think it's right. Uh, but w- one of the reasons for that is that throughout the periods that the 4% rule was originally tested, market prices were relatively low relative to earnings. Like if we use the Schiller or Cape earnings measure, prices have tended to be lower throughout those periods. Now, now they're really high, particularly for US stocks. But the question is, does that extend to factors? Can a factor be cheap and therefore have a higher expected premium? So there are a couple of papers that I found on this. There's one from AQR that was really easy to, to, to digest. So I'm going to mention... I'm going to mention that one. Um, as far as I know, AQR actually created the idea of the, of the value spread. So if you look at the long and the short side of a factor, you can compare the valuation of them. And if, if the valuation spread is bigger, you may be able to expect a higher premium uh, in, the, in the future. So they, they use the value spread in, in the paper that I'm talking about to try and model it out. And they, they found a, a modestly positive relationship in their words for the value factor and weaker correlations for the momentum and low beta factors. And those are the only ones they looked at. Um, so they, they, there's a, there's a bit of a relationship and the other paper that I didn't dig as much into had a very similar finding uh, where, where there is some information in value spreads about future premiums. So if value spreads are wide, like they are now, you might expect a higher premium in the future. Um, but for a higher withdrawal rate. Yes. Would I bet on that? I mean, I don't know. It would be <laughs> irrational for me not to, I guess. Uh, well, but one thing that they did find, and this is very similar to the, and AQR has done really good work on, on the Schiller Cape ratio too. When the market's cheap, you can expect higher returns, but you can't use it as a timing signal. And they found the same thing with the value spread. When the value spread is right. wide, you can expect higher premiums, but you can't use it to time to time value. So I thought I was done this, this topic there, (laughs) but there's a whole body of, of evidence of empirical evidence on, on this other thing. And I, I I apologize to all all of our listeners because this is going to send some people down a whole other rabbit hole that they may not have gone down yet. And maybe they shouldn't even go down. Maybe I shouldn't even talk about this. It seems like it's the dark side. (laughs) So that's your disclaimer. Yeah. But I feel like I've got to talk about it. Let it out. Let it out. (laughs) It it, it wouldn't be intellectually honest to talk about this subject without mentioning the, the empirical evidence on this thing. So the thing I'm talking about is trend following, which is also known as time series momentum. Cross-sectional momentum, which is the one that we were talking about previously, we mentioned the momentum factor, and momentum UMD, up minus down in the Ken French, um, in the Ken French language, is the best performing stocks over some time period, say the, the previous 12 months, minus the worst performing stocks, up minus down. Best performers minus worst performers. That's cross-sectional momentum. Time series momentum is comparing an asset uh, an asset's value to its value over its average value over the previous whatever time period, 10 months, 12 months, whatever you want to call it. Time series momentum is used or can be used as a market timing strategy where when, uh, well, yeah, it can be used as a, as a signal to get into or out of the market based on how an asset is trending relative to its own uh, history. So time series momentum, because you're comparing it to its own time series, as opposed to cross-sectional momentum, where you're comparing it to all other, all other asset returns. Now, the reason that this is empirically interesting is that in the historical data, trend following has, I mean, really undeniably good characteristics. It, in, it increases withdrawal rates 
meaningfully. Like there are different papers that look at this in different ways, but uh, we're talking about like 50% increases, sometimes more in safe withdrawal rates by following a trend following strategy. And I find this, I find this intellectually really challenging because that's market timing and it is. But you can do this systematically. And I'm not saying people should do it, but you can do trend following um, systematically based on rules. And there are lots of different models out there. A lot of them, surprise, surprise, you're sold on, on a subscription basis to get access to the, to the signals. But a lot of them are not. A lot of them you can just do. Does it make, does it make any theoretical sense to you? Uh, well, yeah. It, so it does. And this is part of the challenge, I guess, to... to it clashes with the traditional thinking of you can't time the market and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the, the way that it makes theoretical sense and the theoretical basis for the whole strategy, for the whole trend following strategy is rooted in behavioral finance. I was say it's behavioral, not risk-based. It is absolutely not. Like it's, it's explicitly not risk-based. So I, we, we mentioned when I was talking about adding other additional risk factors to the portfolio, one of the benefits and one of the things that you want from a safe withdrawal rate perspective is to reduce the left tail of the distribution. And trend, using a trend following strategy, does that really well. Like arguably better than, I mean, even in addition to, but, but, but at least as well as, leave it at that, other factors. So it's like, it's like another level of diversification. Now, there are tons of papers out there looking at how trend can improve safe withdrawal rates and how they it just portfolio characteristics in general, tons. All of the papers, most of the papers are in practitioner literature. A lot of them are in the journal of portfolio management, which is mostly practitioner literature. I mean, it's somewhat academic. Um, it is a peer reviewed journal, so it's not like it's garbage or anything like that. In the journal of finance, which is sort of the premier academic, um, sort of theoretically consistent journal that exists. Uh, I, I search for trend in the Journal of Finance database. And there is one article in the history of the Journal of Finance. And this is one of the other things that I find challenging about sort of getting behind trend is like, where, where's the, the deep theoretical discussion? Um, now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not done with this topic. Like it's a huge topic. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot to digest and a lot of really smart people that talk about it which is another reason that it's hard to, to ignore. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I see with it in a, in a second. So there's a paper in the Financial Analyst Journal, which is, again, more, more practitioner literature than it is uh, a, an academic journal. But I pulled a, a quote from this paper, which I thought was, it ca captures the whole concept well. So they say, diversifying across asset classes should nudge portfolio returns in the de desired direction with improved risk return trade-off and possibly a lower maximum loss, which we've just seen. And you can kind of see why this ties in so well with this topic. But an even more powerful technique, according to this paper, this author, can be applied to in individual asset classes to dramatic effect, trend following, whereby one invests in an asset when it is in an, in an uptrend, defined as a current value above some measure of recent past average, and switches to cash when the current value is below such an average. So, I mean, I guess I kind of already described that. But like, again, to reiterate, this is, this is market timing. It's rules-based rules market timing. But it can't be ignored because it's so strong in the, in the data. Now, where I see the biggest theoretical challenge, and I, I think this is an empirical challenge too, and I'll explain why in a second, is that persistence, because this is a purely behavior-based phenomenon, it should be traded away. Now, there are reasons why it wouldn't be, and I'll mention those in a second, but it should be if enough people know about this. If, if everyone's doing trend, it's gone. You're, you're basically buying high, selling higher, in real simple terms. Uh, if it's on an uptrend, you're staying invested. And if it's on a downtrend, then you're going to cash. You wonder which side of that is the most valuable. I mean, there's so many interesting questions. Which side is more valuable? Getting out before it sinks further or getting in as it rises higher? Uh, so I found a, one paper that discusses, discusses trend uh, in a long, short sense. I didn't dig into it, but they were, they were talking about using futures contracts and you could it's be true. long and short. 
And they said most of the value came from the long side. So the upside. So buying high, selling higher. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Uh, so there's a paper from AQR, and AQR is one of the um, firms, or the people from AQR are some of the people that have done some of the most prolific work on this topic. Uh, but they looked at this and they they explained the theory behind why it works. So I'm going to quote them for a second. A large body of research has shown that price trends exist in part due to longstanding behavioral biases exhibited by investors, such as anchoring and hurting as well as the trading activity of nonprofit seeking participants such as central banks and corporate hedging programs. For instance, when central banks intervene to reduce currency and interest rate volatility, they slow down the rate at which information is incorporated into prices, thus creating trends. So interesting reasons. Now that, that theoretical challenge of should this persist, I think that, that the theoretical challenge is augmented by the empirical experience of trend since it became extremely popular. So trend using futures contracts became pretty popular, I think in the, in the eighties and nineties, Cameron, you probably can speak to that better than I can. I don't know if you remember seeing products like that. No, I do not. Okay. So there's CTAs. Um, a lot of them were like two and 20 type hedge funds that were doing this stuff and, and the numbers I think looked pretty good. And so the strategy started to become more and more popular. Um, and then in 2008, Trend following did really well. Actually, I think in, in 2000 as well and 2008, in both of those instances, trend following did really well, um, like mitigated the losses big time, which is what it's designed to do. Since then, though, like since it, it killed it in 2008, it's become increasingly popular. And now there are all sorts of ETFs and mutual funds that anybody can access all sorts. I mean, there, I, I did a search in, in Morningstar Direct to, to speak to some of the data, uh, but there were, I don't know. Oh, I closed Morningstar Direct. Oops. But there are probably, I don't know, more than 20 trend following ETFs and mutual funds. So again, it, it, it speaks to that question of persistence. If, if there are billions of dollars pouring into these types of ETFs, would we expect the favorable characteristics from the past to persist? And I don't know. And then you look at the data and we probably don't have enough data. I probably shouldn't even be commenting on this. And by the way, just so everyone knows, I know that if we were having this conversation about the value premium, I could be bashing it for the same reasons as, as what I'm about to say, because the value has done horribly for the last 10 or so years too. Um, but in this recent COVID related downturn, which like from a, a, a signal timing perspective would be a pretty tricky one to get right. Um, but all the trend ETFs that I looked at in, in Morningstar Direct, they, for the most part, did a little better than like VTI, than the, the, just a broad US market index, yep. which dropped about 30%. All of these trend ETFs did a little better. Some of them did, did a fair amount better, but most of them did a little better, like minus 20, minus 25, that kind of thing. But since then, like if you look from February until now, all of these trend following ETFs are still getting smoked, like still double digit negative returns over the time period, whereas markets back up. Because the signals wouldn't have been fast enough to take advantage of the rapid rebound? I guess, I guess. But this is one incident, you know, and it's, yeah. it's different, who knows? So I, I don't think that this is, that, that data point isn't enough to say, hey, this thing doesn't work anymore. But from the perspective of, of making portfolio allocation decisions, it, it, the, prolif the proliferation of ETFs that are investing in this from a persistence perspective makes me nervous. Like for value or profitability or, or investment or whatever, there, there's at least partially a theoretical risk-based explanation for why they exist. And if at least some of the historical premium is explained by risk, then at least some of the premium should persist in the future. Yep. I think that has to be true. With trend following, there's no real risk-based explanation. And then the other, this is the, the, the big one, is even if we assume, like we can assume with the value, if the value premium goes away, it doesn't mean you're going to get negative returns for the rest of your life. It just means you might not get a premium. You're still going to get stock returns and value is going to do better than growth over some, part, some time periods in the future. It has to. Yep. If, it's just, if there's no premium, it just means you're not going to get a consistently positive premium over the long term. With trend, you're introducing higher costs 
unless you're doing it yourself, which you can do just by trading ETFs. But if you're buying a trend following fund, the fees are higher than a normal ETF. Um, there are some tax implications, although the ETF structure can mitigate some of that. The tax implications would be worse if you're doing it trading on your own, unless you're in a registered account, um, I guess. And then transaction costs in terms of spreads when you're trading, those also obviously eat into returns, especially if you're doing this with any degree of, of frequency. So I mean, in, in short, you're adding a bunch of costs. And if it doesn't persist, it's, it's troublesome. But at the same time, the, 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 the empirical data, and it's not just in stocks, like the research on trend following extends to anything you can think of, currencies, commodities, futures contracts, anything. And how, how does trend following link back to the original question, which is any sense of how it impacts safe withdrawal rates? It's huge. Yes, it's huge. I, I don't have like I don't have the numbers to say that it takes the four percent rule to eight percent or something like that. I think some of the papers might have tried to quantify that, but um, a fifty percent increase in safe withdrawal rates using trend following in the historical data would not be unreasonable. Wow. And I think that's on the low end. I'd have to go back and look. But that so that that's how it relates to this is that using trend following in the data, in the data historically. Uh, it's it's had a phenomenal impact on on results. And I had uh, one of the other reasons I wanted to cover this is that I had some people after we had Michael Kitz's on talking about sequence of returns risk, some people were sending me stuff on trend. And hey, like, what do you think about trend and how this impacts sequence of returns? Yeah. And it, it improves it in the data. I mean, uh, I, it's tricky, right? Like you can go and look at an iShares. I, iShares had value and growth funds for US... Uh, small, mid, and large caps in, I think, uh, June of 2000. So you can go back and look, okay, value ETFs have actually outperformed over the time period when the value premium was positive, which it has been from 2000 until, until now, just not more recently. But as far as I know, there's no live data like that on trend. Maybe there is. Maybe someone can show it to me. But if it's one hedge fund, I, I'm not interested. <laughs> there's a proper data set of, of live trend-following funds be curious to see it. That's it. That's a wrap. <laughs> yep. It's interesting you mentioned the community that's been developing around this. And it, it is so much fun and it's so interesting to engage with people that are part of this community and, and that kind of leads to the next story. So the bad advice of the week is turning out to be a very popular topic on Twitter. So this next one came from our friend Troy in Saskatoon, beautiful Saskatoon, and who, by the way, has already received his Rational Minder hoodie. <laughs> and I, by the way, just got a couple of cases in today of new hoodies. Anyways, it's an article that was in Forbes entitled Stock Market, Goodbye Passive Indexing, Hello Active Stock Picking. So cue the booze. Anyways, the article started with the coronavirus has produced a stock picker's market. Therefore, now is the time to pursue superior returns from stock picking and actively managed funds. And get this, Ben, this new environment could last as a long time for two reasons. Number one, the preponderance of stock investing is currently in index funds and a number of coronavirus negative effects on industries are expected to last a long time. This will cause many stocks to lag while producing opportunities for others to become new leaders. But get this, this is what blows me away. They then display a chart showing the difference in returns for the second quarter and part of the third quarter. Yes, like 18 weeks. And how two active funds, the Vanguard Explorer Fund, which is one of their active portfolios, and the Fidelity Contra Fund outperformed in that 18-week period. And to, quote, think of those differences not academically, but in dollars and cents. And quote, in only four months, 100K in the Fidelity Fund would have grown by, so 100,000 in that Fidelity Fund would have grown by $8,530 more than the S&P 500 ETF. And the Vanguard Fund would have grown by more than $16,000 more than the S&P 500 ETF, exclamation mark. And here's a quote that I could just hear you saying one day. Nothing says compelling and exciting like multi-thousands of dollars in added returns. That's a terrible line. I'm also self-conscious now because I, I just did in the segment on trend following the exact same thing that this guy did <laughs> in, in comparing the active ETFs to the, to the index.
I literally just did the same thing over the same time period. Time period. Did yeah, I give bad advice? I'm, I'm not sure you did it over 18 weeks or not. Um, anyways, well, two, two reasons are often cited. There really is only one reason. They go on to say that indexing might benefit, which is lower fees. However, you get what you pay for because missing from index fund management are skilled analysts and portfolio managers, the necessary ingredient for successful active stock picking. The other benefit in quotes is the belief that active managers cannot beat the market. However, that can become a drawback because active managers can and do beat the market. Moreover, when active is the favored approach, the outperformance can be large. Incredible. Incredible to me. The good news they go on to say is that the passive is that passive has become so entrenched. Think of it as a mindset bubble, Ben. The burgeoning move back to active can produce a dramatic extended period of superior performance for active managers. So the bottom line, now, yes, now is the time to get active. The mindset that the belief that an index fund is the wisest equity investment is broadly held. However, that mindset is inaccurate. There are times when active management easily beats the stock market, and it appears we are entering such a period thanks to the coronavirus shakeup. Therefore, but, but, hold on, hold on. That statement was based on the performance of two funds. For 18 weeks. Right, okay. But that was exciting. It was exciting. Therefore, with a large majority of investors focused on index fund investing, now is an excellent opportunity for actively managed funds to shine. However, moreover, once the passive, active, passive to active cycle gets in gear, the money flow themselves will produce even better actively managed results and excitement. I want to get my popcorn. That sounds pretty exciting. It does sound exciting. I, I really don't understand stuff like that where it's, it's looking such a vast amount of data in the face and saying, no, 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 trust me, we can, we can do this. Look, look at these two funds, at least, at least with the trend following. Whether, whether we want to use it in portfolios or not, at least with that, there is a big, a, a massive amount of data. At least. I don't understand how you can sit there and say, you know, look at this active fund that did well, despite the many, many years of underperformance and all of the, the theoretical um, justification for why that should persist. That's why I always wonder, what is the true motivation, other than business, I get the business side of it, what's your motivation to want to stand in the face of this mountain of peer-reviewed academic evidence, or you just don't know. Maybe you just don't know. Maybe, Maybe it's exciting to, uh, I don't know. There you go. Compelling and exciting. Multi-thousands of dollars in added returns are compelling and exciting. <laughs> that kills me. Think about it in dollar terms. You could have had an extra $2,000 <laughs> if you had an investment. For those 18 weeks. Manager. Anything else? No, I think that's good. As always, thanks for listening.